organizers for uh, inviting me, and also whoever canceled last minute and gave me his spot. Um, and uh, I should say before I begin, all everything I'm going to tell today is, is work done in Venki's lab with other people involved. I'll mention them uh, later. And what we're interested in is figuring out how mice uh, extract information about things they may care about in a cluttered environment. And, and the idea is that we all assume that mice depend on the sense of smell for main, many daily functions. And we believe that the objects that they care about are never presented alone. So somehow, uh, to be able to identify the cheese here, this mouse will have to segregate the odor of the cheese from other odors in the environment. Um, and the way we think about this is, is a, in an olfactory version of the cocktail party problem, the auditory cocktail party problem, in the sense that signals from different objects activate overlapping uh, sensory neurons in the sensory organ. Okay, so the, the brain now needs to take this mixed signal and kind of recover the original sources that gave rise to this mixed signal. So before... Uh, Going into the neural mechanisms, uh, we wanted to have an idea of, of how well we understand the behavior itself. Um, and by understanding behavior, uh, you know, often we take this approach, the, the psychophysical approach, um, that basically says if you can predict the performance of an animal based on some parameter of the stimulus, then you have some good understanding of, of behavioral ability. And this is what we wanted to do here. Um, and to do this, you need two, two different things. You need to be able to measure performance, and you need to be able to define and vary some parameter of the stimulus and see how that relates with, with performance. <laughs> so let me start by describing the, this arm here. So to do this, we uh, devise a task in which mice are required to report detecting uh, a target odor. And the target odor is presented with random sets of background mixtures, pseudo-random. Uh, in more detail a little bit, uh, so we have the world for these mice was composed of 16 monomolecular odors, odorants. Uh, of these, two for each mouse were selected as the targets. Uh, we varied the targets for different mice. And by targets, I mean if you can detect these odors, you can get a reward, okay? The other... 14 odors are distractors in the sense that they may be present, they carry no information about a possible reward. And then in every trial, uh, we present a mixture of these odors, and these mixtures are binary in the sense that each odor is a binary variable, so odors are either present or not present. We do not uh, play with concentrations. And, and the job for the mouse is to just tell us whether one of these two is present within this mixture, okay? Um, and they do so by licking a water spout. If they do, do it correctly, they get a water reward. Okay. So we trained a, a set of mice on this task uh, using this kind of uh, training scheme in which we start with, so what I'm showing here is the distribution of the number of components in the mixture. Okay, so we start with sessions in which most trials actually had just one single odor, uh, but some trials had more than one. Still low numbers. And then as mice learn the task, uh, we progress until we uh, reach this flat distribution uh, in which the, the number of component, of the chance of getting a seven component mixture is the same as six or 14. Yeah, so I didn't, so we go through two different distributions. These are four defined distributions. This is one mouse. This is, I think, the fastest learning mouse. Um, and this is already the flat distribution. Um, so that one of the nice features of this task is, I mean, everyone here uses uh, olfaction and many people use mice. Uh, but one of the really nice things is that this is really quick. So it, in about 800 trials, they get this distribution. And of course, they mostly need to learn the test rules. Everything is arbitrary to begin with. Um, and then as you increase the uh, complexity of, of the task by having larger mixtures, the drop is not huge in performance. Um, all the data I'm going to show you is, is from sessions in which we use flat distributions. 
So uh, one more uh, nice feature of this task is, is that just because of the combinatorics of 16 different odors, you can produce a huge number of different mixtures, way more than the number of trials that any mouse ever does, so that most of the trials that a mouse encounters are novel mixtures he's never seen before. So there, there's no way to make a lookup table and just remember combinations. You, ha you have to perform the actual test. Um, so we trained 13 mice, collected uh, a little over 30,000 uh, trials. And when you look at the performance, first thing to ask is whether it's even sensitive to the background. Um, and you can see that increasing the uh, number of, I'm going to move this, increasing the number of uh, components in the mixture uh, reduces the performance of the animals, which is kind of expected. Uh, another thing you can see here is that because the task is asymmetric in the reward, uh, there's not much information in the go trials. They basically never miss the target. Uh, and the way we interpret this is that when mice have any doubt that the mixture may be there, uh, sorry, that the target may be there, they just go for it. So going doesn't tell us that they knew that the target is there. But um, when they decide not to go, then that really tells us they knew that the target was not present. So if we want to understand what makes them fail, which is really uh, what the psych psychophysical function is about, uh, we really need to analyze the no-go trials, and, and that's what I'm going to show. Um, so, I mean, you could think of this as some sort of psychophysical function. You have a parameter of the stimulus, that's the number of components, and that relates nicely to uh, performance. But it, it's not extremely pleasing because you don't think that all 10 component mixtures are equally difficult, right? So there need, needs to be something that depends on the specific target and background molecules that will make a certain 10 mixture component more difficult than another. Uh, and we wanted to figure out wh what this is. I'll just take a, a small digression. Uh, we try to do this with humans, uh, and we, we did not complete the project. So I'm, I'm not going to make any extremely strong claims. But one of the reasons we could not complete the project is that we basically could not get humans to perform at any reasonable level. Um, so I, you know, maybe we didn't do it. We did it basically the same way as we did with mice, same design of olfactometer, just less odors. So we didn't you know, just ate in the, in the olfactometer. We just couldn't do it. We tried to train ourselves to do it. It still didn't work. Uh, if any human olfaction person is interested in figuring out whether we can actually get humans to do that, I think that would be fantastic. Yeah, so the number is very low. So in, in Lang's papers, uh, they basically did a you know, very similar task. And um, there were two things that I looked at that I thought may be the difference. One of them is that the performance on a single component is kind of low for the humans. So I thought, you know, get get good performance at least on the single component before you say anything about the mixtures. And the second was that they don't train the subjects and we train our mice. So that, what if we train people? Uh, and we tried training ourselves, but, but it, it didn't seem to work. <laughs> yeah, right. They, they tried to make the task as easy as possible by uh, letting people rate familiarity and similarity and choosing the ones that are not similar and familiar. So, and we, we didn't do that. So, you know, I'm not saying that humans can never do this. That, that's not a claim. Right, right. It's always cinnamon that people use for it. So. Sure, so I don't want to make any strong claims. I think one claim is that at least humans are far away from mouse behavior in this respect. So we use the same, less odors, kind of the same odors. Most of them are the same. Uh, we train mice easily. We don't train humans easily. So that, that's the only real claim I have here. OK, going back to mice. Um, yeah. So we, we can 
debate about the synthetic maybe later, but um, I think in my view, once you have a, you've formed an object in your, in your memory, it may not be synthetic anymore when this object is presented with other things. I agree that if you, and, and in, in a way, maybe these targets become an object for the mouse, right? I don't know. But uh, if you just mix unknown molecules and smell this, you won't know that it's a mixture. That I agree. But I think we can have this debate later, maybe. Um, okay, so we, so we want to move beyond the number of components and figure out some other parameter, right, that will describe the relationship, maybe, between target odors and background odors. Um, and, of course, the difficulty that was discussed here um, uh, by multiple people is, is this issue of chemical space. If this is the target, these are two different background odors, how would I say which one is more similar? How do I define parameters that, that relate them? So one way would be to take one of the um, you know, spaces that people here work on. Um, and other ways would be you, know, you can take it in just a complete intuitive uh, view. And uh, let me explain what I mean by this. So these are the 16 odors that we used. Um, and half of them were uh, tiglaic acids. Okay, this structure here within the red um, frame. And the others were not. So obviously I can't really say that these two are more similar than these two, but intuitively maybe they are. So the first thing we wanted to ask is whether, if you are searching for a tiglate target, do you care about whether the background has tiglates or not? And when you do this, uh, let me walk you through this. So in this plot, each pixel is a specific number of combination of the number of tiglates and the number of non-tiglates. Okay, so the column is the number of tiglates, the rows, number of non-tiglates in the mixture, and then the color uh, codes for the performance. Okay, yellow is good performance, blue is not good performance. And what you can see here is that really the color depends on the left, right, right? So just on the column. So if you have a small number of tiglates, these are mice searching for tiglate targets. If you have a small number of tiglates in the mixture, uh, you do well. If you have a large number of tiglates in the mixture, you don't do well. Um, and it doesn't much depend much on the row. So the number of non-tiglates in the mixture doesn't matter that much. Can you tell us about the non-tiglates? Are they also intuitively and related to each other? Not, yeah. not in a way. So I guess, you know, depending on the, they all have some common functional groups, right? Uh, so you could find, I'll get to that in a second, but you, you could probably find a different group that relates some, somehow. These were not chosen to be related. So, um, but maybe relating to your question is you, you could ask whether this is specific to tiglates or could you find a better group? That, um, so to do this, we, you need to kind of quantify the performance of this group, and the way we do it is by fitting just linear fits to each row, okay? Which, tell you what the decrease in performance is when increasing the number of tiglates but holding the number of non-tiglates constant. Okay, so you get one fit for each uh, row and these are all the fits. Um, and then just take the slope, the, the mean slope of these fits, that's the overall tiglate effect in this test. Um, and then, uh, actually not, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have it here. So what we then did is, is you basically split this group of 16 molecules to all possible eight and eight and ask what, what is the slope that we get? And we found that tiglates are among the highest few percent. And if you look at the other groups, it's seven tiglates and one replaced. So, so within this group of, of molecules that we chose, uh, tiglates have a very strong effect. Now, I still think this is kind of striking, but on the other hand, it's not clear how you can generalize this to some other functional group. Um, it probably depends on the size of the functional group, on, on which receptors relate to this functional group, and we don't know. So it would be nice if we could find some other parameter that um, is maybe less intuitive and more easy to, to generalize. Um, so the way we wanted to do this is by thinking, you know, so it doesn't matter really whether chemical structure is similar or not. If we can tell whether they activate uh, receptors in a similar way, then that would be a good measure of similarity. So ba basically use receptor space. Um, and the idea is that you can, um, so basically to do this, we, we imaged OMP GCAM3 mice. The, these we got from the Dulac lab. Uh, Yo Izagai made them. Um, and so we can 
image glomerular activity shown here, and then look at the ROIs for different glomeruli and get, a, you know, for each uh, molecule, you can get a vector that is just a list of activation by different glomeruli, okay? And you do this for a different molecules, so now you have the representations of these different molecules, and these we can relate, you know, in some mathematical way uh, that, that does not rely on our intuition. Um, and once you have these, you, you can, you know, ask, so what is the parameter that you want to define? What, what relationship? And ob obviously one of them would be similarity. You expect that if two uh, molecules activate very similar sets of receptors, then probably one is a difficult uh, background for the other. Uh, but that maybe doesn't have to be the case. And let me walk you through two different um, parameters that we looked at. So assume that this is your target. This is the activation pattern of the receptors that you're searching for, okay? And now you're presented with a mixture that looks like this. So it's not exactly the same, but you've been trained a lot and you know that there's some noise in the system and you think, you know, this could be just one version of the target. So if I were a mouse, I would probably lick for this. Uh, I want to get the reward. But another uh, option you could think of is a mixture that looks more like this. This is, you know, clearly you don't think that this is the target, but this is not what you were asked, right? The task is to figure out whether the target is included in this mixture. So pot potentially this mixture also includes the target. So we call this kind of uh, mixture a masking mixture for the target. Now, what we would want to do is be able to, for each trial, okay, for each mixture that we ever presented, be able to quantify how similar it is to the target and how much it's masking the target, and then ask which one of these parameters correlates with, with performance. Um, and so for similarity, we just use the Pearson correlation coefficient. For masking, uh, what we did is threshold the target response. So we only take glomeruli that are active by the, uh, activated by the target and then basically take the ratio between the mixture and the target and average across glomeruli. And these ratios we bound between zero and one. So it's basically like asking what percent of the target activity is present in the mixture activity, okay? Um, these are all fixed concentrations, yeah. So when we look at the um, performance, it seems much more, much better explained by the masking uh, index than, than by similarity. And, you know, you could think of this as telling you that uh, when there's a background, it doesn't need to be, you know, similarity is a very strict uh, criterion. It, so you don't need to be similar. It's enough that you activate the right receptors. What you do with other receptors doesn't matter, right? That's the idea. So we now basically think that we have uh, some parameter that we can define that explains the performance on a figure background segregation task, okay? So going back to this um, psychophysical curve, we, we basically think now we found a parameter that uh, can produce such a curve. Okay, so the next question is, so obviously there's this debate of synthetic and, and uh, elementary processing. Um, and, and at least in some people's minds, just the fact that animals can solve the task maybe is difficult. So um, the question is, is are, should we be surprised? How, how difficult is this task really? Um, or in a different way of asking the same question, if you read the, these receptor activation maps, how easy is it for you to tell whether the target is present or not? Okay. Um, and this, this is work largely done by Alexander Mathis, who is still, I think, in Lincoln's lab. Um, so what Alex did is first ask, what if we can just find for each target a single glomerulus that if you just listen to that glomerulus, he's specific enough to the target, then you, know, you can solve the test. And the way he did this is by looking at the uh, distribution of the activity level of this glomerulus. So we don't, uh, I, I should say, go back and say something. Uh, we only used the activation maps at this level of individual glomeruli. And we modeled what the mixture actually looks like. I'll get back to this in a second. 
so what we do here is take each glomerulus, okay, and for a specific target, look at the subductivity of this glomerulus for different trials, and ask, do the distributions of the uh, activity levels for trials, go trials, differ from the ones that are no-go trials? Okay, can you put a threshold somewhere that will easily tell you whether the target is present or not? And uh, obviously, in this case, you do pretty bad. So we did this for all uh, glomeruli target odors uh, pairs, and the uh, accuracy levels that we found were uh, far from mass performance. So we doesn't seem to be, you know, there's always the question whether we, if we recorded all glomeruli, we could have found one. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be a, a good explanation for mass behavior in this case. So we then asked uh, whether, if you read combination of glomeruli, not just a single one, uh, can you easily uh, tell whether the target is present or not? And uh, Alex used a linear classifier to do this. Um, and the first pass, we took the linear sum of these uh, glomerular maps as the mixture representation, and the classifier is just perfect. Not a single mistake ever. We then realized that that's kind of unfair. The linear sum doesn't make much sense. It should saturate at some point. Um, and there's probably some noise that you should add. So we did some experiments to, um, to try and come up with a better model of what a mixture is. And so these mixtures were, again, going back to imaging these glomerular responses, repeating each odor multiple times to get some um, estimate of the variance, and also looking at the mixtures and seeing whether we can come up with a model that explains the mixtures based on the uh, single components. And I'll just do this a little bit more quickly. Um, what we saw is that you could typically fit a kind of saturating curve. So what I'm showing here is the linear prediction. Each dot uh, is one mixture. This is a, the whole figure is one glomerulus. Each dot is one specific mixture. Uh, the x-axis is what you predict linearly to be the response. The y-axis is the actual uh, response. And it kind of nicely fits some, some uh, saturating curve. So we plugged into the linear classifier a model that takes into account the 10% variability that we measured in the saturating uh, curve. And the linear classifier still does pretty, pretty well. And this is with a uh, way smaller number of glomeruli than the mouse actually has probably not as accurate measurement of glomerular activity as the mouse uh, has, and still you know, relatively easy to solve. So I'm not, I have no claims that this is how the mouse solves it. I, I don't believe that's the case. But what this tells me is that um, the input layer is, is so rich that you could probably solve way more complex tests. Okay? So we shouldn't be too surprised that it's possible to solve this test. Question? No. Okay. Um, so now what actually drove me to this whole thing is an interest in, in feedback uh, connections. Um, the reason I started doing this task is, is because I was trying to think about what feedback may do, and you, know, you could think of attention-like mechanisms, and, and, and I thought this is the task. So um, the next thing to do is really to try to figure out whether feedback is involved. I haven't done this yet. Uh, what I'm just showing here is, uh, I think, something we should remember is that there's about 10 times, we don't know the exact number, but there's about 10 times more feedback projections from cortex to bulb than the other way around. Um, so they, they probably do something interesting. Um, but I'll just go through what we have done with, with uh, feedback projections, to, and, and that was to look at, basically ask, what does the circuit that receives the feedback information look like? Which neurons in the olfactory bulb receive it, and, and what's the effect on mitral cell uh, output? And uh, we did this. This is with FIVOS uh, that was in Venki's lab then. Uh, we did this looking at the AON. Uh, we injected a virus to express channel adoption in the AON and recorded in the olfactory bulb shine light and see, record from different cell types, see which cells respond. Um, I don't need to go over the bulb circuitry. Um, so the first thing we looked at is, is where these axons actually reach. This was also described yesterday. Uh, and we saw that AON axons don't only go to the granule cell layer, but also reach the glomerular layer. Um, and then in slices, FIVOs recorded from each of these cell types. And uh, I'll start with the mitral cells. So 
if you look at inhibitory currents, then you see very strong inputs from uh, these AON fibers, not directly, but via uh, inhibitory interneurons. And th this was kind of expected. What was a little bit surprising is that if you look at excitatory currents, you also see inputs from the AON. Um, and we did some experiments to show that these are direct AON to mitral cell synapses. Now, the, you can see that the scale bar here is very different. So the excitation is way, way weaker than, than the in, in inhibition. Um, and is also a little bit uh, prior to inhibition because it doesn't go through another interneuron. Uh, we then recorded from inhibitory neurons both uh, granule cells and, and PG cells to ask which ones which ones can uh, contribute to the inhibitory input that we see. Uh, the short story is that basically every cell type that people could identify and record from in SLICE receives direct input from the AON. Um, so they all seem to contribute. And uh, he did some experiments by, by trying to locally block GABA. And it seems like a, a substantial amount from each uh, of these is involved in this inhibition. So we then asked, uh, what, would, what is the effect of this input on mitral cell firing? Um, this is just a conclusion that all cell types seem to receive direct uh, AON. Um, so, so what does the, the AON input do to mitral cell firing? Uh, we went in vivo uh, to record single units. Uh, this, this is by what, the way uh, is all work in rats, the AON stuff. Um, and you can see when you shine light, there's very, very strong inhibition, basically silences uh, mitral cells. And uh, we asked, it took us a while to figure out why we never see the excitation uh, until uh, David Geyer said, maybe you're not looking at the right temporal resolution. Uh, so if you use one millisecond bin uh, PSTHs, th then you start seeing the excitation. I'll zoom this up even more. And, and the excitation has a small effect of producing one spike with not an extremely high probability but it's just one spike, uh, and then the inhibition kicks in. Um, so, you know, we, this doesn't tell us exactly what the AON does and how it's involved in uh, figure background segregation, uh, but the one thing that it does tell us is that, you know, the input from the cortex is not a weak modulation. It at least has the potential to very strongly modulate mitral selectivity uh, in a way much easier to see uh, strong responses with AON activation than with odors. Right? Um, okay, so I'll summarize. Yeah, I, this, this is going to be much faster. Um, so the first thing is we found that mice can easily detect odors that are embed, embedded in the background mixtures. Uh, you know, if you looked at the psychophysical curve, we, we don't reach much far on the curve. We didn't really challenge them with a uh, 16 odors. Um, we think that we have a parameter that describes the difficulty of this task, and that's this masking, which is basically the overlap in the representation of the target odors and the background odors. Uh, you know, you could solve this task with a simple linear uh, readout, uh, so, so we shouldn't be surprised that, that the task is solvable. Um, and feedback is a very powerful or potentially very powerful uh, modulator of olfactory bulb output. So I'll, I'll just mention what the burning questions for me are uh, right now. Um, and the first two that are very related is, is, is this really an attention task? Um, can we show that attention is involved by uh, showing that when a mouse is searching for one target, he's going to miss the other target? Something, something of that sort. And very related, our top down signals involved. So can we show that they actually do something and, and figure out what? Um, another question that I, I find really interesting is, is there anywhere in the olfactory system where you really see background invariant responses? It's like the IT and visual cortex where you know, feature, the, the exact features don't matter, it's just the object matters. Um, so we want to search for that. Question about the masking experiment. So yeah. can you? Um, can, can I just thank say? people and then you'll ask? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I. No, there is no second. Um, so I just want to thank, uh, first of all, Venki. All this work was done in his lab. All these people were involved in it. Um, Matthias Betke, 
uh, was involved in the classifier. Uh, and this, I think, is, 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 did you draw this, Tim? Uh, no. No, okay. Artist, so. so. If I drew it, it would be five lines. I see. Because Andreas already showed the cover, so I showed this one. Um, Tim's version of uh, the olfactory cocktail party problem. Yeah. Thank you.